Adam, in your case, the world you went to versus, or the world you were at versus the world you went to where you're controlling that distribution, you're eliminating the, the number of sellers, which ultimately means you're having to turn down POs. How do you kind of get growth out of that? And it, again, it feels somewhat counterintuitive that you would turn away POs in order to grow your brand. Can you walk, walk everyone through that a little bit? Yep, yep, sure. It's another good question. I think um, Whitney said one thing that is, is very true and very important that uh, e-control isn't about just online control. It's about, um, it's about implementing a holistic strategy for controlling your brand in every channel. It just so happens that the online channel is the one that presents the most risk to brands losing control. Um, to your first question there, John, you know, by turning down POs or by limiting your distribution in certain ways, that doesn't decrease the demand because the demand will, <clears throat> demand will, <clears throat> will always exist. And for us, you know, where that demand is driven by professionals, by doctors, um, whether the, the actual purchasing happens through one or two online distributors or 200, the demand is always there. It's just a matter of what kind of experience those consumers have with your brand and with your products when they go to purchase them. And for us, that's what brand control is about. Um, I often say that brand control is really the unsung hero of any growth-based strategy or any growth-based outcome that you hope to achieve. Because only once you control your distribution, your content, um, effectively enforce a map policy, um, can you then take the steps and implement the strategy, the commercial strategy to actually grow your brand in an effective way. Um, and for us, initially brand control was not really about growth at all. It was about protecting the customers that, value, that we valued the most, which is our doctors, to, to enforce those relationships and reinforce those relationships and strengthen them so that we could protect the long-term sustainability of our business. Um, and it was about brand integrity. Um, the idea that, uh, you know, for, for brands like us or for direct to consumer brands, you want to be in the driver's seat of the experience that your consumer is having. Um, and for us, that happens in two ways. It happens through doctors who, uh, want to feel confident when they're recommending a product, when they're educating a patient about a product or about one of our brands. And it happens online through, uh, through, through a platform like Amazon, for example, where we're educating the consumer ourselves, or in this case, through pattern, about our brand and products. And if you're not doing that in a controlled, um, effective, deliberate way, you run the risk of losing brand integrity. Um, and like I said before, you know, in, in 2015, 2014, we had over 300 third-party gray market Amazon resellers. Um, they were all selling uh, our products. In our catalog for peer encapsulations, we have about 600 products. There were over 30,000 unique uh, listings <clears throat> set up for our products, all with different content, most of it not regulatory compliant, most of it if you know, did not originate from us, the brand. And we initiated a process to consolidate our distribution to a small group of trusted sellers who properly managed the content. And like Zach said, gave a uniform standardized experience to, con to, to consumers, no matter where they were purchasing it, whether they were purchasing it in a doctor's office or in a health food store um, or a pharmacy or online on Amazon, we wanted that experience to be uniform. And that's what we did. It was an e-control framework leveraging um, you know, a lot of what, what Whitney is talking about to more effectively manage distribution, um, to effectively manage uh, uh, control over who was reselling online, map policy, and then finding a partner to help us to control our content and pattern. Um, what it did was it established transparency and trust with our doctors as well as our patients when they went to purchase our products directly online. 
Hey, John. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I always find this this topic interesting of how does control equal equal growth. And, you know, sometimes I you know, I think it helps to just at least for me to think about sort of at a at a very nuts and bolts level. Um, you know, we had at our conference a a representative from a leading retailer and, and she basically said, here's how it works. You know, if someone comes in, they see our product here and they pull up their phone and they show that the product is avail available for a, a much lower price. We enter all that into our database. And then when we meet, we meet with the brand, if they don't have good control online, we tell them they're not gonna get optimal shelf space any longer. We're gonna promote the brands that have good control. We tell them we often we wanna carry less products. We ask them to lower their price, period. On the flip side, if a brand walks into us and says, look, you're not gonna have people just pulling up your phone saying I can find it for cheaper or find it somewhere else online and they have a decent product, then we're, we're much more likely to buy from them as opposed to their competitors, often give them better pricing, better promotion, better shelf space and sort of lean into that brand. So presidents of, I've seen presidents of multiple companies and business units that aren't driven by their own e-commerce incentives or their own you know, sales incentives of the brick and mortar channel, but are looking at the overall growth saying, hmm, if I can get really good control online, I can go grow by taking a lot of money from my, a lot of share from my competitors in those brick and mortar retailers. Then you turn around on the e-commerce channel and you look at Amazon and you know, if I, want to, if I want to beat my competitors in selling on Amazon, it's like, what levers can I pull? Well, I've got to, I've got to be able to run really good advert. I need someone to run really good advertising. I need someone to win in SEO. I need someone to invest a lot in content. I need someone to drive a lot of traffic to, to the ASIN. If I got a bunch of people that are all sitting there and on good control, then no one's motivated. No one's going to invest in doing that. But if I have a partner like a pattern and they're getting 95% of the sales, and now they go throw the gasoline on all these demand generating things. Now my brand really starts to grow up and I'm taking traffic away from my competition. So I really think that, you know, just from a strategic point of view, the brands that do really well today use it as, as that sort of you know, fulcrum to, to basically drive their growth, both on, on the e-commerce channels and drive it in the, uh, really drive it in the brick and mortar channels. 